I mean, many months ago when Jim suggested I talk at this year's meeting um, about RBG's 350th anniversary, of course, we had no idea then just how much the, the world was about to change. And it, it certainly hasn't been the uh, 350th anniversary year we were expecting or planning, but uh, search for positives we must. And, uh, uh, you know, the development of online conferences such as this are, are a great way to keep in touch. Now, if we were at, at the botanics before giving a talk, I would usually double up on outlining um, some domestic arrangements. So um, to provide some continuity before I kick off, I can confirm I have no fire drill planned at home. Your toilets and your kettles are in their usual locations. So enough frivolity, uh, RBG at uh, 350. And in today's talk, I'm gonna cover uh, um, a few highlights, looking back over our 350 year history, then give you a flavor of some of our current international collaborative projects and finish by describing some work we're doing using genomics to understand plant biodiversity in the British flora. But it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty miserable day out there. So to start with, um, I just wanna bring some uh, botanical color. I'm not quite sure what the weather's like in the rest of Scotland, but my uh, wheelie bin was whizzing across the, the lawn just a few minutes ago here in Edinburgh. It's absolutely foul. So here's just some uh, warmer colors. And, and really just to highlight that the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh consists of four gardens. There's our Edinburgh garden in the top right-hand corner of the screen there, our home for the last 200 years. Uh, in the bottom right, our specialist uh, garden down in Doik in the Borders region with a very continental climate. Bottom left is, is, is Logan, which is almost subtropical climate, allowing the growth of a range of quite exotic plant species. And then up in the top left of the screen there, Ben Moore, incredibly high levels of rainfall in that garden. So collectively, those four gardens uh, allow us to grow 13 and a half thousand plant species from 157 countries and collectively that makes up the remarkable living plant collections in our care. So that's a, that's a very long way from RBG's origins when Robert Sibbald and Andrew Balfour, two physicians, established a physic garden in the grounds of Holyrood Palace in 1670. Now, the, the precise location of the garden at Holyrood is uncertain, but what we do know is that on acquiring a small patch of land, they established around 900 types of plants for medicinal use. Their, their needs rapidly outgrew the available space, and shortly after, actually just five years, in, in fact, in, in 1675, uh, a second site was acquired. Uh, located uh, now at what would be the east end of Waverley Station. So this was a somewhat bigger site, about 300 foot long by 190 foot wide. And there were about 2000 plants grown there. So Sybil, one of the garden's founders, of course has a uh, Sybaldia procumbens named after him, just beautifully shown on one of these specimens from the RBG herbarium. And there's a nice continuity of history that uh, Sybaldia forms the RBG logo, which you can see in the top left of the screen there. Another claim to fame of Sybil, and I, I didn't know this until recently, was that he produced one of the first descriptions of a blue whale from a specimen beached in the fourth estuary, and hence that's why the blue whale was previously referred to as Sybil's raw call. So almost 100 years after the founding of the original garden at Holyrood, so in 1763, the garden moved again, and this time to Leith Walk, to a, a five acre site, Although clearly a very, it's a very different leaf walk to that that we see today, and there is a definite absence of tram related roadworks. And the founding of the Leith Walk Garden was a, was a time of great development of RBG, led by John Hope. Its finances were put on a sound footing by an endowment from the Crown. And Hope was a, a visionary lecturer, and his teaching diagrams are, are still held in the RBG archives, and they give 
fascinating insights into the experimental botany of the day and his teachings of plant responses to environmental stimuli such as light and gravity. Now, around this time, Hope and his students were exploring Scotland, undertaking some pioneering fieldwork as early botanical recorders. And one, um, James Robertson, is credited with the first recorded ascent of Ben Nevis in 1771. And it's, uh, I'm just really flagging this because it's worth noting that uh, 2021 will be the 250th anniversary of this re first recorded ascent of the Ben. And um, given that that first ascent was by a botanist, that seems an anniversary worth marking. Now, of course, uh, there will undoubtedly have been uh, earlier ascents that are not recorded. And um, Henry Nolte drew my attention to records of specimens of Veronica Alpina from Ben Nevis in the catalogue of Hope's Herbarium, uh, dated back to 1768, a few years earlier. So that gives some anecdotal evidence that Hope's other students had been very close to the summit a few years earlier. Now those Hope specimens are lost and in their absence, and this is purely just for visual pleasure, here is a specimen of the uh, oldest Veronica Alpina from Ben Nevis that we have in our herbarium, which is a, a mere um, youngster from 1839. So in 1820, 57 years after the Leith Garden was established, that was when the move to the current Inverleith site began. So when we when we started the move to our to our current location 200 years ago. But just before we leave the Leith Walk site, it's worth drawing attention to the building here in the foreground. So it's the entrance to the garden, the home of the principal gardener, and the classroom where medical students were taught botany. Now the Botanics Cottage, as we now call it, became derelict in its Leith Walk location, and it was moved brick by brick and painstakingly restored as a community hub at our Inverleith Garden. And so wonderful preservation of that historical connection. And of course, it's a, it's a great pleasure to teach students in the professor's room there in a, in a building steeped in history. Now, just thinking about the logistics of moving an entire garden, it, it took two years to move from uh, Leith Walk down to Inverleith. And uh, I, I, this, this picture catches the scale of the challenge and one can only imagine the remarkable ingenuity and patience that was required to undertake this. Now, since then, that main garden at Inverleith Row has grown and developed considerably and changed in many ways. And here is the rock garden looking very different back in 1875. It's very difficult to, to, to select the things to talk about in this rich history of uh, Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. And, and whatever I choose has to be brief and selective. But one of them that I was going to highlight is the role that the botanics played in today's access to the countryside. And uh, I'm, I'm doing it now in the talk as some of the key events took place soon after the move to the Invalid site. Now there's a wonderful account of this by our archivist, Leonie Patterson on our Botanic Stories page, which I'm going to pre-see here. So on Saturday, the 21st of August, 1847, the Regis Keeper of the time, John Hutton Balfour and his students left Braemar by carriage to the north end of Glen Tilt, planning to spend the day botanizing through Glen Tilt and finishing up in Blair Athol by evening. Balfour was sure it was a public right of way. The Duke of Athol, however, begged to differ. As the students neared the foot of the Glen, they found their way barred by the Duke's gillies. They could not pass without the Duke's permission. A standoff occurred and the so-called Battle of Glen Tilt became immortalized in song. So this was a precursor to formal legal challenge and ultimately the foundation of the Scottish Rights of Way Society and ultimately the 
challenges that led to the access to the countryside that we enjoy today. Uh, don't, in case anybody was worrying, I'm not going to uh, attempt uh, Scott's dialect and, and, and massacre the marvellous uh, song of the battle at Glen Tilt, but you can see the wonderful prose before you on the screen. And of course, John Hutton Balfour was, was one of the founders of the Botanical Society of Scotland uh, in, in 1836. And that's the same year when both the BSBI and the BSS, as we know them today, came into being. And it's also worth noting that the, the subsequent transfer of the Botanical Society's herbarium to RBGE in 1863 was a major stage in the development of the herbarium collection that's currently in our care. So the final vignette of uh, history I'm going to cover relates to um, the, the early stages that led to the foundation of links of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh with China and Himalayan botany. And I'm just going to highlight George Forrest's botanical expeditions to China between 1904 and 1932. And he introduced many Chinese plants to Western horticulture made uh, prodigious collections of plants um, from the region, including 1,200 species new to science and, and, and many different rhododendrons. Working with a, an extensive network of local collectors led by uh, Lao Chao, uh, pictured here, Forrest amassed over 30,000 specimens which we house in our herbarium today. And this picture catches the, the scale of this early collecting operations. And these include some absolutely uh, exquisite specimens such as this delphinium collected in 1918, just before the end of the First World War. Now we have many photographs, journals and maps from these expeditions in our archives, including this photograph of the Yulong Mountain in Yunnan. And in the years since Forrest's collecting trips, the years since this picture was taken, botanical collaboration with China has grown and, and flourished. And this has included uh, many visits to the UK of leading Chinese botanists, uh, and particularly notably including uh, Chen Fenghuai, who is known as the father of Chinese botanic gardens. And these collaborations continue through to the present day. Um, uh, RBGE is twinned with the Kunming Institute of Botany and jointly established the Jade Dragon Field Station on the Yulong Mountain. And it really is worth just reflecting on the incredible diversity of that, that mountain, the, the mountain you can see the picture there has a recorded 3,000 vascular plant species on that one massif, making it a wonderful botanical laboratory. So these first few centuries of our history have led to many scientific discoveries and resulted in the rich collections now in our care. Our herbarium includes specimens that have, of, of species that are now extinct, such as these of Cyania, Logania, and Campanula. But also specimens of great cultural interest. So the oldest specimen in the RBG herbarium is uh, the Cape Myrtle, collected in 1697. We have specimens collected from the first to Franklin expeditions to the Canadian Arctic before the ill-fated and tragic third Northwest Passage expedition, Cardamine digitata there. And there are about 60 specimens from the Voyage of the Beagle, including this Chaptalia collected by Darwin in Argentina. Now, it's important to note that not all of our specimens have positive stories behind them. And there's work underway at the minute to better understand and to communicate the history of the acquisition of our collections. And that includes how the collection of some of our specimens involved brutality and exploitation. And a major focus of current activity is digitization of the herbarium to make 
the collection globally accessible and it's great to be able to share these high resolution scans now. It was a particular push to make specimens available to biodiverse countries in the global south and we're just about to launch a, a second big push at accelerating the digitization program to get 500,000 more specimens digitized in the next three years and that'll take us to one million out of our three million specimens available as a digital image online. So before I move on to our present day research, I just want to acknowledge the important floristic and monographic work of the last few decades that, that really does lay the foundations for the current research and conservation programs. And so botanists at RBG have worked on major flora projects in Asia, such as uh, flora of Turkey, Bhutan and Arabia, and also projects like this ethnoflora of the Socotra Archipelago. And RBG was a, a editorial center of, for the English language version of the flora of China. So alongside that uh, floristic work in Asia, there was Jimmy Ratz's work, understanding the ecology of the Brazilian Cerrado. Monographic work on temperate and tropical rhododendrons by David Chamberlain and George Argent, exquisitely portrayed here in these uh, dissected photographs by David Purvis. And extensive work understanding the remarkable variation in the African violet family, and that was initiated by Olive Hilliard and, and Bill Burton. Again, that work continues today. So building on this, on this rich history, our current mission is to explore, conserve, and explain the world of plants for a better future. And we currently have projects in about 35 countries around the world. And I'm going to start by highlighting just a few of these before then moving on to some work focused here in Scotland. But firstly, then just to look at the current international program and a major theme of that remains understanding the diversity and distribution of plants. And a, and a great example to give of this is work uh, by Tina Sarkinen, uh, Domingos Cardosa and colleagues. And there was a major collaboration of 45 authors to produce the first verified checklist of 1,403 seed plants of lowland Amazonia. So producing baseline data to underpin conservation planning. And I, I kind of find it really sobering that that's published in 2017, the first verified checklist published as late as 2017 of one of these key um, biomes of our planet. Similarly, work led by uh, Toby Pennington and uh, Karina Banda and 61 co-authors as part of this large scale dry floor network are looking at the extremely threatened dry forests of the Neotropics. So unlike the Amazon rainforest, which relatively speaking is, is, is relatively intact, emphasis on the word relative there, these dry forest systems um, are now thought to be reduced to only about 10% of their original extent. And this study provide, provided a quantification of the distribution of almost 7,000 species of woody plants, showing high dissimilarity between regions. And a primary focus of the study is the identification of areas of high level of endemism and high levels of diversity that currently lack conservation protection. So another focus of, of work at present is on understanding the diversity of species rich herbaceous groups in the tropics and uh, you know, there is an enormous amount unknown about the diversity patterns in tropical herbs and uh, a big focus of this work has been on uh, begonia and begonia is an absolutely remarkable genus with remarkable diversity of plants and I, I I personally 
have never partic particularly warmed to some of the, the foul begonia bedding plants. Apologies if there were any uh, great admirers of those. I shouldn't have said foul, but uh, I, 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 they're not my they're not my favourites. But the diversity of the uh, the diversity of this genus is absolutely incredible. And um, work by Mark Hughes and colleagues have been looking at the historical biogeography of the genus. They've shown very neatly that it had an origin in Africa, estimated to be about twenty five million years ago, with a couple of migrations to South America an evidence for a single colonization and diversification event in Asia to explain most of the diversity we see there today. And, you know, one of the remarkable things about begonia is its remarkable species richness. It's got a large number of species, many new species being described each year, and many of those species have extremely restricted uh, distributions. And a, a colleague, Peter Moonlight, rather nicely created the concept of B2K, and that's the imminent point at which Begonia will reach 2000 scientifically described species, something that we predict will happen extremely soon as we're already at 1990 described species in this genus, quite remarkable diversity. So that was really focusing then on um, documenting patterns of diversity and, and distribution in our international science program. And I now just want to shift in emphasis from that documentation of biodiversity to understanding the drivers of change, understanding some of the drivers leading to biodiversity loss. And one particular example I want to give is um, looking at how large scale land use change can impact on biodiversity loss. And this is a study led by uh, Antia Ahrens and Xu Jian Xu from the Kunming Institute of Botany, focusing on understanding risks to biodiversity and livelihoods from rubber plantations. So there's a huge global demand for car tires of about, uh, with about 1 billion car with about 1 billion tires being manufactured per year. And this has been driving land use conversion in Southeast Asia to rubber plantations. And of course, there's no oversight, no central plan as to where these plantations are established. And in this study, combining satellite imagery and modeling showed that almost 50% of rubber plantations are now planted outside of their environmental optima. So in this figure, red is good, green is marginal, and, and, and blue is outside of the optima. So about 50% of the population of the plantations are outside of their environmental optima and at risk of plantation failure. And this model prediction was supported by ground truthing, on the ground checks and trawling through local reports showing high rates of plantation loss in areas that are classed as unsuitable by the model. So a key output of this study is to provide uh, information to minimize the likelihood of loss-loss scenarios. So this is to provide information to avoid situations where high biodiversity value forest is cleared for plantations which ultimately fail and provide limited livelihood benefits. Another conservation project uh, at the Botanics is the International Conifer Conservation Project. Um, is led by Martin Gardner. And this picture here shows the devastating impacts of nickel mining on the uh, remarkable endemic Araucaria of New Caledonia. And I'm just using this as a, as a backdrop for describing the work of the conifer conservation program. So about a third of all conifers classed as threatened with extinction. And the uh, International Conifer Conservation Program has established a, a network of safe sites. So this is, you know, far exceeding, exceeding the available estate in the four gardens of the botanics to grow threatened conifers in these safe houses 
to protect them from extinction threats in the wild. And this allows the, the, you know, the growth of large genetically diverse populations and potentially providing material to support restoration and reintroduction programs. So having uh, whizzed, whizzed around the world, uh, I'm gonna come back to some projects using DNA to study the, the Scottish and wider British flora. And uh, firstly, I want to look at bluebells and the perennial story of the threat to the, the native bluebell, Hyacinthoides non scripta, from the introduced uh, Spanish bluebell, Hyacinthoides uh, hispanica. Um, uh, you, you know, and the, the common escapee from horticultural introduction. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is, is based on a long running collaboration with many people, including uh, Jane Squirrel, uh, Deborah Cohen and Marcus Rusham at, at RBG, Fred Rumsey and colleagues at the NHM and researchers in Queen Mary University. And from a much larger project, I'm just going to focus on uh, two particular questions, the taxonomic status of the non-native bluebells uh, in the UK and, 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 and touch on how extensive the threat is to the, the native bluebell. And um, the background to this project then is the notion that we have the Spanish bluebell, Hyacinthoides hispanica in the UK um, from a horticultural introduction, and that this regularly hybridizes with the native non scripta to form the hybrid uh, Hyacinthoides masatiana, and that repeated backcrossing to non scripta could threaten the native bluebell. So that's the kind of backdrop to the story. But what's really motivated this study comes from the observation that what we call Hyacinthoides hispanica in the UK doesn't look the same as Hyacinthoides hispanica in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and hence, we weren't sure that there's clear evidence for the presence of both parental taxa in the UK. And as noted by others, that the taxon reported as the hybrid also has characters that aren't purely intermediate uh, between the putative parents. And so perhaps the, the, the clearest way of, of, of summarizing the findings from this project is this diagram here of um, genetic relationships revealed by a, a large number of genetic markers. So we included in this analysis reference material of um, Hyacinthoides non scripta, the native bluebell from the UK and Iberia, and Hyacinthoides hispanica from Iberia, along with a representative spread of non-native bluebells in the UK, including those we found that had the closest match to Iberian hispanica. Now, these genetic data clearly separate the Iberian Hyacinthoides hispanica, shown here in red, from non scripta in blue. And in turn, we can genetically separate the UK and Iberian non scripta populations. The non native bluebells in the UK have all have a genetic pattern consistent with them being hybrid between Hispanica and non scripta. So we didn't find any plants in the UK that had a morphological or genetic match to, to true Hispanica. And that's consistent with the view that what we call the Spanish bluebell in the UK is all or at least predominantly the, the hybrid taxon. And this, this hybrid position of these non-natives using genetic data is much clearer than we got when we repeated this with a formal morphometric study where, where the findings were more ambiguous. Now, if we look further into the origins of the non-native bluebells in, in, in the UK, and I'm not going to show the data here because it's, it's, it's quite complicated to present, but just to, to talk it through. And this was mainly work done by colleagues at Natural History Museum in London, that the, the geographic structure in chloroplast DNA indicates that the Hyacinthoides hispanica 
contribution to the non-natives in the UK can be pinned down to likely origins in southwest Portugal, close to Lisbon. So that's the region in Iberia that has got the best match to the non-native genes which we find today in these UK non-native bluebells. So in summary, we don't find any evidence of true Hyacinthoides hispanica in the UK. Instead, the non-native plants we see in the UK all seem to be hybrids between non-scripta containing some Hispanica genes, which ultimately had their origin in Portugal from near Lisbon. So in terms of uh, thinking about the, the, the frequent newspaper headlines of the, the, threat to the, non, uh, the threat to the native bluebell in the UK from the non-native bluebells, this extinction threat by hybridization, uh, to look at this, we undertook some studies combining uh, paternity analyses and measures of pollen fertility to get some insights into how likely this would be. Um, and these are just very preliminary studies. I, I should say that they're building on the observation of the far greater numerical supremacy of the native bluebell in the UK. There are simply many, many more individuals of Hyacinthoides non scripta, which will provide considerable resilience just simply based on the very large size of that population. But our studies looking at the non-native bluebells in the UK can be summarized as saying that in general, they have uh, lower fertility. Um, so here's a summary of levels of pollen fertility between uh, non scripta and, and the non native bluebells and this this figure just simply shows each of these columns is a uh, population average and uh, the higher those boxes are on the figure, the more fertile the pollen is and you can see the boxes are higher up in the figure in Hyacinthoides non scripta and they're much more variable and lower in the non-native bluebells in the UK. And uh, we tested this further by doing paternity analysis, just arranging a grid of plants, putting them next to each other, collecting the seeds and doing genetic analyses to see who was the father. And those studies showed a um, three to one greater siring success of the native bluebell compared to the, the non-native bluebell. So combined this greater fertility of the native bluebells um, should act as a break on the extent to which the non-native genes will introgress into the native bluebell population. Um, I, uh, yeah, I came a bit of a cropper trying to explain this particular study to a, a journalist, which uh, resulted in the um, following I, I guess best described as unfortunate headline. Um, uh, it was my attempt to use some general terms to explain the, the study. But anyway, at least the general sentiment of reduced fertility of the non-native bluebell is conveyed by the article. So this bluebell example, it's been a really enjoyable study to be involved in combining uh, genetics with experimentation and, and, and field work. And, and I guess I catch this as, a, as a, um, an individually designed, bespoke approach to, to a project. So we had a particular question and we designed a bunch of work uh, to address it. I'm, I'm just going to contrast this now to two other projects I'm going to talk about. These are two very large and incredibly ambitious international collaborations. And here the emphasis is focusing on standardizing the approach, focusing on building an international infrastructure to study the world's biodiversity. And these two programs I'm going to talk about are the International Barcode of Life Project and here the aim is to use DNA to tell the world species apart. And then also talk about the Earth Biogenome Project, which focuses on sequencing entire genomes. 
So just to clarify the difference between these major projects, for those of you not familiar with the terminology or if this is uh, abstract in, in, in some way. So, so DNA barcoding aims to use the minimum amount of DNA possible to tell as many species apart as possible. So that's to make it rapid and scalable, essentially to allow large scale DNA based identification and monitoring of biodiversity. So by way of analogy, it's sequencing the tip of the iceberg of an organism's DNA, just one or a few genes of DNA used as an indexer to tell species apart. Whole genome sequencing, in contrast, goes way beyond this. This is about finding about everything in the genome. In, by way of the metaphor illustrated uh, here, it's sequencing the full depth of the iceberg, aiming to essentially uncover the full blueprint and instruction manual that is contained in an organism's genome. And of course, it stands to reason that barcoding is cheaper and easier to do for lots of individuals and it's much harder and more expensive to sequence entire genomes. So starting with uh, DNA barcoding, this, this idea of using just one or a few bits of DNA to tell as many species apart as possible. The approach was pioneered by uh, Paul Hebert in Canada and uh, RBG with colleagues in the Kunming Institute of Botany, we've played a major role in coordinating the global efforts for plants. But I should just really stress at the outset, what is key to DNA barcoding is that it's a huge collaborative endeavor aiming to build a shared resource. And there are some numbers on the screen here, which just catch the scale of this international collaboration. 22,858 users of the main barcode database from 145 countries collectively producing over 1600 scientific papers last year alone. And we can see now some huge levels of data being generated um, using a common set of genes uh, on life on Earth. I'm working with the uh, National Botanic Garden in Wales. Uh, all the UK native angiosperms have been DNA barcoded, and uh, many of the bryophytes have also been barcoded. So almost all of the liverworts and um, uh, quite a lot of the mosses uh, that are of conservation concern. So just some examples of this, and the approach works particularly well in bryophytes, and David Bell pictured here, used this approach a few years ago to lead to the discovery of uh, Herbertus norinus as a new liverwort species in Scotland and Norway. And uh, more recently, he's been using DNA barcoding combined with morphology to unpick what at times can be the rather chaotic understanding of taxon limits more widely in the genus. And I just, this diagram here depicts uh, at the start of his study, the application of names to the evolutionary relationships of the samples. And you can see that that can best be described as uh, a non straightforward situation. Um, and so he's been using DNA sequence data, DNA barcoding data in an iterative fashion to generate a sequence based framework, go back and look at the morphology and use this to identify discrete evolutionary units that correspond to morphologically and genetically coherent species. So using the DNA barcoding to help refine our understanding of taxonomy as well as it being a tool to enable identification. Now, a great benefit of DNA barcoding is it works regardless of the morphological state of the tissue. It will, it will work on anything. It doesn't need high quality, um, perfectly formed specimens. And Becky Yar and colleagues are using um, the approach to DNA sequence fecal samples to identify which species of plants and lichens the reindeer herd in the Cairngorms National Park are eating. So using DNA barcoding to gain insights into diet analysis and uh, sequence based identification of fecal material is far more pleasant than detailed morphological uh, sifting through the fecal samples. So just to uh, lift the tone from the sequencing of fecal matter to something less indelicate. Um, I've just pasted in a, a screenshot of this paper from colleagues in Canada to remind me to highlight um, 
the developing field of eDNA sequencing. So again, this is just thinking about moving away from using DNA to sequence a specimen that one has in front of you, one can sequence a fecal sample. And this is the next step uh, along that journey where one is essentially just sequencing environmental samples where one detects the presence of taxa by detecting traces of DNA they've left behind. And in this case, uh, the detection of previously unrecorded Potomogeton species in a Canadian nature reserve by picking up traces of their DNA from sequencing water samples from a lake. So there's great potential there for undertaking survey work in difficult to survey large water bodies uh, by just doing point sequencing of water samples. Now, although there's a wealth of activity using DNA barcoding in plants, it, it's, it's very far from a, a panacea. And it, although it's really, I mean, it's really excellent in, in insects. It, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic for telling insect species apart. And in many plant groups, it works very well. However, there are also many plant groups in where it doesn't provide adequate resolution and related species can share barcodes and not be uniquely distinguishable. Uh, and, and that's particularly evident in, in, in groups like Willows. I, I love the title of this paper, Understanding the Spectacular Failure of DNA Barcoding in, in Willows. So with this in mind, we're now heavily involved in work using uh, new sequencing technologies, new sequencing approaches to develop a new wave and a next wave of plant barcoding techniques where we extend the the approach to improve its resolution. And that's very much a focus of the uh, current active uh, research and thinking at the botanics and in, in a, a group of laboratories we're collaborating with. So now moving on to uh, the Earth Biogenome Project. So what I've just been talking about is sequencing a little bit of DNA from all species to tell them apart. I'm now moving to the concept of sequencing all of the DNA of all of the species. So clearly that's much harder. The approach is still in its infancy. But in terms of tackling this in a place, all of the organisms in a place, the Darwin Tree of Life project based uh, in Britain and Ireland is the first project in the world doing this at scale with the ultimate aim of genome sequencing um, all 60 to 70,000 or so multicellular species in Britain and Ireland. It's quite a uh, remarkably ambitious project. It's led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute and there's a range of UK partners in, and uh, RBG and Q are coordinating the work for plants. Now, Alex Twyford is heavily involved in this project, covered it in detail in his uh, Botanical Society lecture on Thursday, which I know many of you are at. So I'm only gonna cover the project here briefly, other than to note that the British flora is absolutely perfect from this project and building on the incredible knowledge bank of plant diversity made possible by the wealth of natural history recording from the BSBI, BSS and others over the years gives this incredible set of knowledge resources. And these are critical as it will enable the linkages to be made to contextualize the results of the genome sequence data in terms of the ecology, taxonomy, distributions, and organismal biology. Now, the overall aim of the project over the next 10 years is to cover all native land plants in um, Britain and Ireland, and the most important non-native species. In this first phase, and that's the first funded phase, running through till 2022, um, we aim to have sequenced the entire genomes of roughly 10% of the native vascular plant and bryophyte flora. COVID impacted on field plans for the first year of the project. It was not a year to, to launch a major collecting project. Um, but rather excitingly, the first 60 species were sent down to the Sanger Institute um, just a couple of days ago. And uh, on the various size screens that you're watching this on, I hope at least some of you have got screens big enough to make out the, the list in the first batch. And you can see there there's Thrift, Alpine South Thistle, Ash, Juniper, CP, Twin Flower, Small Cow Wheat, 
woolly willow, witch elm, so some great botanical icons in there. Uh, even, even the task of shipping these samples is non-trivial, so Michelle Hart is the uh, PI on the, the grant here, the, the principal investigator on the grant here at the Botanics, and uh, in that bin uh, is a dewer where all of the samples are kept down at minus 197 degrees, and, and we have to absolutely shepherd the material so that we can get fresh material deep freeze it, extremely deep freeze it immediately to keep uh, the material intact to make it possible to extract high molecular weight DNA, which makes the high quality genome sequencing possible. So even this act of, uh, of collecting has its uh, complexities and certainly these um, Jewers full of liquid nitrogen aren't just simply popped in the post. Um, but we've got some uh, extremely exciting times ahead, and it really does feel like we're on the verge of a new phase of discovery in terms of access to new data on the British uh, and Irish flora. So that was a whistle stop tour of uh, RBG at 350th. Um, I've given you some snippets of our early history, talked about the collections in our care our international research, and some of the current DNA research on the British and Irish flora. Much has changed since 1670, um, but the importance of understanding the natural world and using plants for societal benefit has remained a constant. Uh, in, yeah, in case you're uh, wincing at this picture with the lack of social distancing and definitely a group larger than six from more than two households. I, uh, I can reassure you that this picture was taken back in those heady days of social promiscuity in January earlier this year. So looking to the future, there's a increasing urgency to understand and conserve plant biodiversity with 20 to 40% of plant species considered threatened with extinction to some degree and still an estimated 70,000 land plant species awaiting scientific discovery and description you know, based on extrapolation. And even the species we know about, there's still much to learn. The botanics for sure will continue to change and evolve and at its 400th birthday, it will no doubt uh, look different again. Um, but even in the next few years, big changes are coming. The Scottish government's low carbon fund has committed a major investment to support an overhaul of our Edinburgh garden, including much needed renovation and restoration of the heritage glass houses, uh, establishment of a sustainable energy center, new plant health laboratories and quarantine facilities desperately needed replacement of our behind the scenes research glass houses which really are creaking and precarious and plans illustrated here for a new showcase glass house uh, it's just an artist's impression uh, adjoining the existing main range there's also much work underway nationally and internationally to plan how countries respond to the biodiversity crisis and climate emergency and you know, policy documents can often make turgid region reading, but I'd like to finish with this policy ambition from the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, because I think this so perfectly expresses a guiding statement for our future work to, to, to undertake action across society to put biodiversity on a path to recovery for the benefit of planet and, and people. It's wonderfully eloquently expressed and that serves very well for us to guide the thinking of how we can contribute to that uh, aspiration and challenge. So as a final wrap up, a big thank you to the, the multitude of people whose work is mentioned in this talk. Uh, I hope I represented it okay and didn't mangle anything along the way. Uh, if you would like to know more about the work discussed here, um, please follow the RBG Science Twitter account or visit our web pages. Um, but particularly to draw your attention to the Botanic Stories uh, blogging platform. If you didn't know about this, it's an absolutely wonderful 
blogging platform full of fascinating stories and informal insights. And you can find out about many of those historical and uh, contemporary projects I've talked about today on that blogging platform. Just to highlight two forthcoming events that might be of interest, um, and this is part of our 350th anniversary uh, lecture program uh, on bonfire night, November the 5th. Uh, there'll be some lectures on the botanics and its international connections. And uh, on the 26th of November, a international panel discussion joint with the Royal Society of Edinburgh, focusing on the topic of halting plant extinction. So thank you all for joining to listen. It's, it's been a real pleasure to speak today. And uh, also just to finish by saying how delighted I am with the uh, rich and ongoing collaborations between the Botanics and the BSBI and the BSS. Thank you. Jim, I think you're still muted. Peter, that was a fantastic talk. I, I love those old maps of uh, Embra and the photograph of men wheeling trees from one site of a botanic garden to the next. Um, and uh, those old specimens of Darwin specimens and the, that first specimen in 1767. It was great to see those and, and make the links with history. Uh, but one question I have, while people are using the Q&A function to ask, put questions uh, to me and my fellow co-host, Lindsay McKinley, who will uh, join us shortly, is, um, I was very, I love the idea of um, uh, surveying for aquatic plants by checking the, for the DNA in the water. But is, is, is that not prohibitively expensive to do in a normal course of surveying? I, I mean, we're definitely at the uh, R&D stage in that kind of work. So, and at the minute, it's far from routine. And I'd say that there's two, uh, you know, to go out and do that tomorrow, there, there are two rate limiting steps. One is, one is cost and the other is still calibration of the, of the methodology for interpreting the results. Um, so it, it's, it's at its early stages, there's greater confidence in the ability to detect presence. Um, there's of course, lower confidence in the ability to detect absence and quantification is extremely difficult. Um, nevertheless, there's a, there's a lot of work going on at the minute focusing on both bringing costs down and calibration and interpretation. So I think that that is something that will be coming as something that is affordable in the years ahead. And I guess in terms of cost, it's also worth thinking about the benefits of, for instance, being able to detect invasive species uh, early on in the time period of an establishment where control may be easier compared to some of the costs of, of control downstream when, when, when things are large enough to find easily. Um, sequencing costs and the molecular biology costs are, I mean, they're not, they're not quite in free fall, but what we view as expensive today is um, definitely affordable tomorrow. And if one thinks about the, the billions spent to sequence the human genome, and the costs of a few thousand pounds that we're estimating for sequencing genomes in the Darwin tree of life. That gives you some indication of the magnitude of the decrease in, in price over you know, a, a, relatively, a relatively small number of years. Um, 
so I, I really the the idea of in, including that in the uh, in the presentation was to catch the excitement of something that is uh, uh, on, on the horizon. So it's not not ready to go and roll out at the minute, but as a as an additional um, as an additional tool in the toolkit of monitoring, there's there's something exciting looking like it'll be available. It sounds very it sounds very exciting. Uh, okay, I've got another question here um, from Julia Wilson. Uh, could you enlarge on the present day role of the RBGE in teaching and education? Uh, wonderful question. Thank you. So uh, I, there was a there's a great phrase from uh, Teddy Bear's Picnic to PhD is a good way of describing the range of learning opportunities at uh, RBGE, and um, there's a range of informal and formal courses at the garden and that education program as just said runs right the way through to um, from the schools program through to specialist training perhaps two areas that I, I, I I'd like to focus attention on is the extremely long running horticultural education programs uh, the great flagship of HND and BSC in horticulture. And that I think is a wonderful course with a, uh, a wonderful history and huge uptake. We also run an MSc in the biodiversity and taxonomy of plants that's just had its 25th anniversary. And uh, that has students attending from all around the world and that provides a great bridge program after degree level education through to professional training and it has an incredible uh, statistic of something greater than 90 percent of the attendees on that course over the years are still in um, either botanical education or employment. The one other thing I should add to it, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a, uh, an additional motivator as to how we deliver education online. And we, like other organizations, are still in the learning curve of how to do that. But prior, prior to 2020, there was a strong fo focus via our Propagate Learning platform of delivering uh, courses around the world and it always uh, you know, amazed me you can do a botanical illustration course and uh, you could be doing that in Orkney or you could be doing that in, in Thailand and being part of the same course so we've, we, we've, we've for a long time had an interest in online learning but of course with all of the events of 2020 that's been rapidly accelerated and there's a lot of effort underway at the minute to try and get slicker and smoother in how we do that. We're doing the first, normally we would do a field trip for the master's students to Columbia and we're just in the middle of designing a virtual field course. Thank you. Uh, now we're, we're running a bit over, uh, but uh, Lindsay, I wonder if you can put the next question to Pete. Yeah, no, absolutely, Pete. There's been a lot of interest on uh, the Bluebell front, uh, myself as well, as I'll be mentioning the results of that to my Spanish in-laws when I next see them. Uh, however, the, the, first, the first question here is uh, from Jonathan Shanklin. Uh, is true Hispanica present in the UK or just things that look a bit like it? Uh, our understanding, I mean, you know, we, we, we haven't looked at every, every, every bluebell in the UK, but certainly the, 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 the field teams that have spent a long time looking at this, so Deborah Cohen has spent a long time in the field, and her view is that she hasn't seen true Hispanica in the UK, and we just have things that look a bit like it, but that everything, everything that we've looked at, um, and everything we've looked at genetically, uh, it doesn't match the true Hispanica, and it all appears to be this hybrid taxon. Okay, that probably answers the next question was, uh, is non-native Hispanica present in the gardens in the UK then? It's, it's not so clear. 
just just say again the um that broke it's, up a bit yeah is non-native uh, hispanica present in gardens in the uk not in a widespread fashion i think most of that that what one is seeing in the garden is our are, are hybrid cultivars okay okay uh, but, sorry jim uh uh, thank you both. Uh, I think we should probably wrap up. It's quarter past 11 now. Um, Peter, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for taking the, the time out to present live to the Scottish Botanist Conference this morning.